Delighted to have you all here. We are going to optimize this by getting right at it. Trinity, we're going deeper into our nature and identity, Trinitarian nature, unsurpassed nature, identity, and the very fabric of love that is God. So I'm going to dive right into this. Hopefully you can see the screen. And uh, first of all, a very quick bit about Steph and I. Let me get over. Let me see. Let me click on this thing, maybe. Okay, there we go. So in brief, Stephanie and I, uh, there we are, my beautiful love of my life, married, uh, coming up on 25 years, and six children, you can see there, with a new son-in-law last year, and also, you see the blessing in a, that's in our backyard, each of our children, the youngest is 16, the oldest is 22, and a beautiful little blessing born last before. week, that's our little Magdalena Grace, I'm glad I'm seeing your smiles, it tells me you're seeing the screen. <laughs> And she just came to join us at our house first time a couple hours ago. So we're very blessed by her. Um, By the way, this will be very real, very folksy. I think Steph is maybe silencing some knife cutting in the background and such. So it's all good. It's all family. All right. Um, So my background, basically, before and full-time ministry was film marketing. Faith meets culture film marketing. So these are just a few of the projects I was blessed to work on. Narnia, Superman Returns. Um, God of the Girl, some of you may know Damascus, an awesome Catholic campus in the center of Ohio, reaching thousands throughout the world. Make that note, CYSC. So Dan Demite on the far left there, he was in this A&E film. One day we'll have to see it. All right. Uh, Champions of Faith, great series, kind of Rocky Balboa meets um, Catholic superstar Major League Baseball players. Um, hard as nails, Justin Fatika. We got a really good connection with him. I was involved with that project and a number of others. But now we are full time in this marriage and family mission called Mass Impact. But it's easy just to remember the proclamation. I love my family. Us. In a word, we are about uniting us, marriages and families, and more fully discovering, proclaiming, living, and building the kingdom. So. Really, John Paul II, St. John Paul II is our hero and our guide among all, the entire church, but him. So he said the future passes, future of humanity passes by way of the family. And also, Familiaris Consortio is great encyclical letter to families. Family, become what you are. You'll find these threads throughout this whole, I think, seven weeks going deeper into the heart and mystery of family as an image of the Trinity and family living it here on earth. All right, let's get down to this. So. Um, T. T is for truth. And is truth not under fire? Of course it is. Here are some examples just to demonstrate the nature of this battle in understanding truth. Um, I might say the thesis was articulated by Justice Kennedy in the Obergefell case in 2015, where he said, we have the right to define and express our own identity. Now, one isn't going to take away from somebody their opinion, right? But does that correspond to our nature? Do we have power over nature to, de- to determine our identity? This pretty much at a Supreme Court level had an ep- epic influence, in, I think in a large way, capping what culture was already saying. Um, and we go back to one of our favorite movies, Jesus of Nazareth. What is truth? Pontius Pilate asks. We're still asking that question. So some examples. In 2012, mayors of Chicago and Boston declared Chick-fil-A had no place in their cities because their executive held marriage between a man and a woman. Example two, several states forced Catholic charities out of the adoption business, either because the charity does not offer same-sex spousal benefits or declines to place children for adoption with same-sex couples. Three, Twitter locked the account the other day of Representative Vicki Hartzler, she's a Republican from Missouri, after she tweeted this seemingly very provocative message, women's sports are for women, not men pretending to be women. Now these last two, pay attention to these. And by the way, I want to state this up front, wherever you're at in any of this, we are fallen, we are sinners, we need God's grace. And you may get this theme, we're not going to presume to erase the line because we struggle with it. My struggle may not be whatever somebody dealing with homosexual desires are, but God knows I've got my struggles that merit my self-mastery. And so this is being attuned away in a particular way. The enemy is causing us, causing many in culture to disregard truth. So children as young as five are being encouraged to disregard their anatomy 
and choose their gender based on their feelings. Last week, a California mother raged at the Spreckles Union School District Board for allowing teachers to coach her 12-year-old daughter on becoming a boy, choosing a boy's name and hiding the plan from the family. Finally, real deal here. California law was Bill 1184, Newsom says name, prohibits insurance companies, this is actual language from the law, prohibits insurance companies from revealing to the policyholder, that it'd be you and me as parents, typically the sensitive services of anyone on their policy, including minor children. These sensitive services include abortions, sexual assault treatment, drug abuse and mental health treatment, cross sex hormones, puberty blockers, and sex change operations. In California, Minors can consent to all of these sensitive treatments, except for sex change surgeries after the age of 12 under certain conditions and consent to abortions at any age. Again, just a portrait of where our culture is concretely at, codified, institutionalized. Let's move forward here. Um, We, there are consequences, of course, Um, And I think the great producer, director, Cecil B. DeMille said it in his movie, he's the one of the Ten Commandments, said we cannot break the Ten Commandments. We can only break ourselves against them. Think about it. What commandment or moral law have any of us ever broken in life that did not, in fact, really break us? He goes on to say, or else by keeping them, rise through them to the fullness of freedom under God. God means us to be free. With daring, divine daring, he gave us the power of choice. So some scripture passages that I think very much define ages gone by, but maybe again have been institutionalized in our modern culture. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie and worshiped and served created things rather than creator. Another one, woe unto them that call evil good and good evil that put darkness for light and light for darkness, that put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. We're all familiar, perhaps a few months ago, where Chelsea Clinton had essentially declared abortion a sacrament in what Jesus would want to allow um, that choice to be made. Again, praying for all the confusion. She has hers, I've got mine. We don't erase it, but it conveys the battle here. The thief comes only to steal and to kill and destroy, John 10.10. So consequences, as Cecil B. DeMille said, it's not simply an ideological, ethereal thing, this battle lingering out there somewhere. It takes effect concretely in our lives. We see it in our own maybe marriages and families. We see it with those that we work with. We see it in the culture around us. This ought to really anybody who cares for somebody who's suffering minimally awaken us to, is this good or is this objectively bad? These are just some of the consequences Chemical abuse, the highest rate in history recorded, porn proliferation, gender dysphoria, marital neglect, infidelity, and divorce, highest rates ever, domestic and other violence, highest rates ever, institutional complicity, that's what we're talking about. I might say ecclesial impotence, let me clarify, we believe that our Catholic Church is perfect and true, given by Christ. But in its institutional form, which we are all part of, insofar as we are imperfect, we're seeing an absence of the kind of courage around across the board with rare examples. We are part of that, by the way. There's an absence of responding to a lot of these things in a regular way to deal with people's wounds. And I'd say this is one that affects all of us to certain degrees, unprecedented anxiety, depression, and suicide. So, yeah, welcome to the power hour. Isn't this all happy so far? We're going to turn a corner. Just hold on. But let's let's get the portrait here, right? Let's recognize truth as being assailed. Okay, so this is maybe another hard piece because what I just spoke of maybe is applicable to those who don't know Jesus, applicable to those outside the church. So as I, in the minimal time we had, I wanted to ask the question, how might we as Catholics be particularly challenged and influenced by this battle for objective truth and to know it? Pope Benedict identify something he calls practical atheism. In so many words, he is suggesting here to those who go to mass, who pray the rosary, who do their novenas, who have ashes on their head, mine are all from today, uh, who are faithful externally, 
who have behavior observance of, uh, of the faith, maybe even perfectly, he describes this, shall I say, pandemic of practical atheism, which in so many words is that our love of Christ, the lordship of Jesus, is not in the fabric of all we do. It's not at that motive level of the decisions that we make with our time, with our money, with our energies, with, with our lives. When nobody is looking, when nobody sees, that's the measure. If we had cameras around our home, seeing the kinds of interactions we were having, that would be the measure. And Pope Benedict is acknowledging this sort of duality that exists of a performance Christianity. Pelagianism would be the early heresy. This propensity for us to know these things and think that we're good because we do them. And he's inviting us to go deeper as we're inviting you to join us to go deeper and get at that heart motive level and transform our hearts, Lord Jesus, Romans 12, 1 and 2. But to recognize practical atheism for a rich faith such as ours is a very prominent challenge to many of us. Um, this is a decisive truth which always challenges me. In all of these, I am deeply challenged. Yes, Magdalena, you may have heard her give a little shout out in the background. Anyways, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven, but only the one who does the will of my father. And he goes on to say, many will say, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name and in your name drive out demons and in the name, your name perform many miracles. Let me pause. If you knew family members or friends right now who are prophesying, like could read souls, speak into them. If they were healing people, even raising them from the dead, would we not say and agree, man, that person is very holy. Like wh how indicative of a godliness. Jesus goes on to say, so if that I might say, I go to mass, I, I'm on my retreats, my crucios, my chirps, my ignites, whatever they are, all wonderful things. But Jesus goes on to say, and I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So it seems to me that we as a community here, as married couples, ought to get a lasso around what does Jesus mean by I never knew you. That we can have perfect behavior observance, which is a sign of love. Let's not dismiss that. To do what God asks, all of his commands, but at a deeper level. What is he challenging us in this realm of truth? What does it mean to know? So here's some very fun words to know. You've got the uh, Hebrew and the Greek which I have no idea, Gnosko, I might take a shot at it. This is the word that that's from. And basically it means to know, especially through personal experience. And as the same verb is in Luke 134, where Mary says, I do not know man, it has sexual conjugal intimacy connotations. This is the nature of God's, in Christ, desire for relationship with himself in Jesus, a, a, of a nature of a sexual intimacy, a total body self-gift, an irrevocable totality of heart, mind, body, and soul. That's something for us to shoot for, isn't it? That more excited than the Super Bowl a couple of weeks ago or whatever may happen in our lives, that we're, we're, we are so attuned to God and in that intimate level. So, um, so a couple um, passages that really capture this heart piece, not dismissing the objective because the objective truth God gives us and reveals to us, but the subjective piece that John Paul II really awakened us to, right? Reawakened us to in the church is where is my heart at? How important is the heart for an orthodox, solid Catholic? And um, a couple verses here. So foretelling in the Old Testament, where we saw the battle of them following God's will, right? And doing well and being blessed. And then they would get cocky. They get arrogant, right? And they would, they would uh, lose their eyes, turn their eyes from God as soon as they came out of the desert and they'd find themselves exiled or, or just in this place of debauchery and darkness. And so they, they didn't have the consistency. And so God saw this and he spoke to the prophet Ezekiel. Hey, I see what's going on this up and down and on and off. And he says, I will give you a new heart and put a new spirit in you. I'll remove from you your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh. I will put my spirit in you and move you to follow my decrees and be careful to keep my laws. A second one from Jeremiah 31, 33. I will put my law in their minds and write it in their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. A third one, focusing again on love in its essence. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. Again, the second one is to love your neighbor as yourself. This is the greatest commandment. Jesus himself, our Lord himself saying it. First Corinthians, I may speak in the tongue of men and angels, but if I have not love, I'm just a resounding gong, a clanging cymbal. 
Let's think about it, men, women, what words come out of our mouths often in our homes, our families, our relationships. They could even be religious thoughts. It can be the rosary. But if love isn't the heart of it, it's, it's a clanging gong. Um, he goes on to say, if I have the gift of prophecy, again, all these manifestations, and can fathom all mysteries and knowledge, but if I, if I have a faith that can move mountains, but if I have love, I have nothing. In the catechism, in so many words, this is so challenging to us who maybe grew up in the faith or came to the faith. What is decisive in this area of truth? What God is saying to us is that if we don't connect with the dispositions at the heart of the disciplines, it's superstition. I'll say that again. If we don't connect with the dispositions, the heart piece at the heart of the disciplines is just superstition. Without love, there is no truth. These are the ways that we Catholics are challenged. So truth affirmed, love has a shape. Truth is not something we can presume to create. I think, by the way, this cuts through every cultural challenge, every legal, institutional challenge, ecclesial challenge. This punctuates the battle, if you will, and the decisive um, opportunity for us to choose. Truth is not something we can presume to create. I can't create my gender. I can't say that abortion is good. I can't determine um, so many things about the world. Truth is not something we can create. Truth is someone in whom we are created. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. Truth is a person. So from our identity flows our mission, right? If we connect with this heart piece in Christ, our nature, the fabric of God who is love, who created us, Given God's revelation, we are eternally defined by our response of either reception or rejection. It's worthy to think about that in the particulars. How does God reveal his desire for us as men or women in our marriage? He reveals it as an occasion for us to either receive it in our hearts or reject it. So we do um, something called Mission One Marriage Retreats. They're three-day retreats. And they're awesome. We go through kingdom of God alive personally, marriage, family, and world. And this is just a, a sheet that where the rubber hits the road, right? Because we could sit and hear a great talk from Father Ricardo or Bob Schutz or some of our great speakers we're going to hear over the next seven weeks. And we could maybe just feel good about, yeah, I connect with this love thing, God. I connect with the desire to love and I'm going to love my wife more. But here's where the rubber hits the road. I just took six questions from the evaluation that helps us evaluate this. So I'm going to take you literally just think about this with our time running short. If you were to rate each of these below yourself, the degree to which you are a zero or a 10. Now, by the way, 10 is perfect sainthood in each of these areas. So together we remain attuned to the father's heart of love for us, his power and purpose through shared, dedicated prayer daily. How would you rate yourselves? Today, we remain attuned to the Father's heart of love for us, his power and purpose through shared, dedicated prayer daily. Secondly, together we name and renounce any emotional and spiritual attacks on our relationship. What does that mean, men? That means if your wife is struggling with something emotionally conflicted, work, home, school, we have the Father's heart for her. And privately, we're praying for grace. We're praying for her to know her value, how beautiful she is. We go deeper than whatever that surface issue is. Your issue is, And we speak to whatever those whispers and lies are. And in the name of Jesus, I renounce those lies. I renounce that confusion because I love you. And because God made me on the front lines as your husband to do battle with you. Do we do that or just get in the weeds and fight it out over the, the superficial things? Again, a challenge for all of us. I wish I could say I'm a 10, but it's very powerful when we do that. Thirdly, together we seek to understand, name, and renounce the enemy and all his works. How is the enemy active in our lives? Through addictions, food, chemicals, appearance, money, material, status, power. Again, husband and wife, tremendous gift to know the way the enemy's working or influencing us, to name them and renounce them in the name of Jesus. Together, for we speak life to one another, our children and our community. If an inventory was taken of our words, where do they land in terms of our heart's connection to the Father and speaking life? Because speaking is so powerful, right? The mighty Ruah that hovered across the waters, God's word speaking and causing all creation to come into existence. So we, dignified in the image and likeness of God, have the power through words to speak life and renounce evil. 
Five, together we create an atmosphere of apology and forgiveness by modeling it. We invite us through these seven weeks to recover that. If we need to apologize and forgive after this is done, that might be one of the most consequential things we could do. Clear the air, recognize our faults and failings. Say, hey, pray for me. I'm fallen. I need God's grace. I want to be a better husband. I apologize. Will you forgive me? That would be a very powerful thing to do. All the more if we do it on a weekly, on a daily basis. Don't let that, uh, don't let that get in the way. Finally, together we listen to one another and others with the Father's heart. Moving quickly here. Our ultimate story, our story is an ultimate drama starring each of us. So I want you to take a moment and think about, some of you are familiar with this, of your favorite movie. What might that be? Sound of Music, Lord of the Rings, um, so many good movies. Gladiator, I, I like many of them. So uh, what about Bob? I'm going to go funny. So there are many movies that have been created. And every story, I'm going to make a bold statement that every story, every movie ever created and of the lives of humanity really reveal four basic moments. Every single one. Number one, there's a starting point. That's not really prophetic. Number two, the protagonist, those going through this experience, a crucible, a struggle, a crisis, a challenge. Again, whether it's Frodo or whether it's Maximus, whatever it is, what happens then? Thirdly, through that crucible, they more fully discover their identity it awakens them to who they are. The Lion King very much punctuates that, doesn't it? Um, from Which informs their mission. Four main movements. Now, each of these movements, there's something that deeply resonates with every person in, on the planet that causes us to spend collectively billions of dollars in stories, in movies, and in books. Perhaps we're not meant to be just spectators. Perhaps it's resonating with us something of our very nature. And so let's give different words to each of these movements and consider. Starting point is life. The crucible is death. The discovering our identity is resurrection, which informs our mission. Pentecost, what does that sound like? The life of Christ. Whether you are Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, Christian, Vulcan, Hobbit, all of us share this fabric of God, of the Trinity. We image him. This is the motion and movements of our life, the very nature that God has called us to, without which we will be empty if we don't understand the tremendous gift that God, wherever we're at in, these, in this life at any moment, that we're experiencing these things, the pattern of Christ, which Christ himself experienced. He is the way, the truth, and the life. So there's movements in between each one. So we have the moments and we have the movements between life and death is being emptied of ourselves, Philippians 2 emptied of the junk, of the debris. So what? So we can be filled with God's grace. Confession leads, we come and we're filled with his grace, the capacity to image God and bring his life to build the kingdom to overflow. It's not meant to just end with us on that retreat, end with this tonight, but it's meant so to be so vibrant, so abundant that it overflows in life-giving streams to our marriage, our family, and all that we are associated with. So truth of marriage summarized, our identity is that man and woman image God, Genesis 1, Our mission is to make God who is love known. Is the world not looking for God? Is the world not pining for evidence that God is with them? That is yours and my supreme, amazing, epic call to image God, to make him known. It's a purpose of marriage and family. And how do we do that? Because we can't do it alone. We do it because Christ dignified us through, with, and in Jesus Christ. So I think we made it in 25 minutes. We're going to break up in a group now in just a moment, but my wife is going to give you a few um, considerations to maybe make this even more concrete. And then we're going to go into our breakout groups. So Greg, those of you who know him, he's like the fancy schmancy techno dude. I have my little ripped out pencil. <laughs> Only three minutes. One my minute. pencil, little, little notes when we found out that we needed to do this rather quickly. Um, so I just want to declare the truth of marriage is beauty, hmm. right? That it is, it is truly a gift from God, an incredible sacramental grace um, that it is good, that it is precious, that it needs protection. Um, and again, grateful and blessed that we are able to journey with you, that you're able to journey with us over these next weeks of Lent to um, kind of pinpoint those absolute truths 
that the Lord wishes to highlight. And when we were kind of talking about this for tonight, something that came to mind for me was um, a, a, we interviewed Father John Ricardo recently, and he gave some advice to families, to couples for this Lent. And so I'm just going to reiterate them because they were so um, on point. And the word truth comes, right? When do we really, really want to hear the truth the most? When we're at a doctor's office, right? We want to just hear straight up what's going on. You know, we look around if we're in a war, which we pray for peace, right? But we want to know exactly what's going on so that we know how to, you know, go there and the truth of the enemy. So just very, very briefly, um, if you have a pencil or a pen or a computer and want to jot this down, I just really encourage you to pray together with these th three things from Father Ricardo that he um, offered. So the first one was for us as couples to pray with the mindset of a physician that um, it's, he described it as looking at a spiritual MRI of, you know, yourself, your marriage, your family, however you want to do that and just pray, Lord, show me the single biggest wound. Show me that single biggest wound. And from that build a plan. So again, to pray with the mindset of a physician. So I'm just going to, you know, not fill these out as much. You guys can do that. The second was to pray with the mindset of a general. So to look at the map of territory, territory of your hearts, territory of our, your marriage, territory of your family, and then pray, Lord, what area here that is occupied by the enemy? What is that area that you want to liberate that you are asking us to attack, then build a strategy, right? We can hear all these things or know these things, but to act on them. So again, the first one with the physician to see that wound and to build a plan, just like you would if you went to the doctor, right? In war, you know, the mindset of the general, you know, what, what's being occupied that we need to attack and then come up with a plan. And then the third one, and finally, I just thought was so powerful and so true and real is to ask the Lord to see the mission control uh, in hell. Like, how is the evil one looking at your life, your marriage, your family? What plan does he have? to destroy that, to come after that. The Lord wants us to win. He wants us to grow in freedom and holiness, to be engaged, to help others in liberation. So what is hell's strategy? If you were the enemy, what would you do to render ineffective the plan? And I think if we had time, and if you want to talk about this later as a couple, they would come to mind really quickly in marriage, right? You know, unkind words, fears, suspicion, jealousy, um, resentments, unforgiveness. So if they come that quickly, you can imagine what the enemy wants to go after. So as a couple, build a plan to come against those, come against those. So to look at those and to pray, the Lord wants to um, show the hurt, show the liberation, show the plans so that all of it can be to be healed and to become saints together. Lord Jesus Christ, together we proclaim that you are love itself. We acknowledge that your love holds us in existence. We proclaim that our marital relationship is the very fabric of your love. Today, again, we receive the powerful grace flowing from our sacramental marriage, flowing from your very heart while we were dying, while you were dying on the cross. Lord Jesus Christ, together with confidence, we bring to you every struggle, difficulty, and challenge. We recognize in these your, in these your hand molding us for sainthood, the opportunity to sacrificially pour ourselves out for the good of one another, always, without counting the cost, without reservation, that we might become like you. Lord Jesus Christ, together we recognize that our marriage and family is the primary target of Satan, adversary. In your name, we renounce all his lies and whispers that in any way has held or holds us captive, that in any way has influence. 
right now in your holy name, the name of Jesus, through the powerful intercession of our blessed mother Mary, who crushes his head, we break his chains definitively, completely. Lord Jesus Christ, together in this very moment, we humbly avail our souls anew to you. In this very moment, we pray that you flood us with an abundance of your holy presence, that the authenticity of our faith will constantly shine through ready forgiveness, apology, and pursuit of your magnanimous love. Lord Jesus Christ, together we thank you for the amazing gift you give us in one another, in every way, the opportunity to attain holiness, to become what we are in you, to become saints. Today, again, we reclaim and declare our marital identity and mission to make you who are love known. Amen. 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 In the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. You guys are all free to go. Thank you so much for saying yes to this. I think God's going to work powerfully. Thanks, Thanks for your patience. Hey, 931. We didn't do so bad. God bless. Thank you, Greg and Stephanie. Thank you. Thank you. Kind of blessing. Discuss and, you know, any, anything that jumped out, mm -hmm. um, we just encourage you to process more. <laughs> McDonough's, give me an update. How are you guys doing? You're still hanging out here, which is cool. How's the McDonough family? They're so adorable. We actually wanted to tell you, so um, with the whole fiasco from back in September, and then you guys very graciously prayed over Katie that one night at Holy Trinity in Assumption, we had a follow-up cardiology appointment shortly after. It was just okay, so-so news. Then Monday, this past Monday, is in two days ago, she had a follow-up appointment, and we're officially to that step where she's being weaned off all medication. Oh, and praise in God. May, should be the final cardiology appointment. And then from then on, it's just annual. Like it's, she's mm. put a number on it. 96% back Praise to Jesus. Life. That's amazing. Wow. Thank you, Jesus. For anybody who's listening and isn't familiar wow, with this. Yeah, awesome. so we give Praise glory, God. Glory, glory to God. To God. Um, big backstory. Won't go into it all, but just pause. I just want to hug you. Ah. <laughs> I can give a brief synopsis. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. In um, September, yeah. So in August, we had our fifth child. And Ada is her name. She's amazing. Six months Ada old. Ada Joan. All well. Yes. Yeah. Ada Joan. And there's a whole long story behind that too. But in September, three weeks after, Katie was in the hospital for like a week. And turns out it was really poor heart function. Um, she even called it heart failure at some time, her, her cardiologist. And we didn't know if it would get better or what that looks like and what healing would look like. So lots of prayer, um, just doing what we were told. And... <laughs> daily prayer, really. And thanks to all of our awesome friends and praying over her and all that. Uh, here we are now, regular follow-up appointments and also medication for uh, improved heart function. And here we are. It might not be safe for us to have more children, but she's had eight pregnancies when we were told that she may not ever be able to get pregnant. Um, so yeah, our fifth born child, Ada, she's great. Life is good. Congratulations. Thank you. That's Absolutely. Beautiful. Just a word Thanks to everybody, absolutely, episodes. we'll say this to everybody, but it doesn't take the special guru, superstar priest to simply call upon the name of Jesus and pray over somebody for healing. It can be that simple. In the name of Jesus, I renounce the sickness. I speak to the cancer, the heart disease, whatever it may be. In the name of Jesus, I ask for healing and restoration. We're experiencing that more and more. And I love your testimony. I love that your husband prayed over you so many times, your community praying over you. Your children. We were just privileged to have those little hands with you at that Ignite moment. But, you know, th this is the heritage, inheritance of being Christian by virtue of baptism, breakthrough the resistance, awkwardness, weirdness that for whatever reason, Catholics in modern day, because in the old days, that's what they did. Let's do it. Yeah. That's my encouragement. 